Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello again. You know, I always appreciate you guys tuning in. Today is something really interesting. With me is Frank Amato from Synapse DX. Did I get that right? You did. That's great. Oh, Thank you, Jennifer. Yay. Hey, you know, I must be doing something right because I'm getting better with remembering how to pronounce names. <laughs> My <laughs> listeners know I'm really good at butchering those. And we are talking today about a new skin test that doctors can use to detect Alzheimer's in people early on. So thanks for joining me, Frank. My pleasure. Thank you for having me today, Jennifer. So why don't you give us a little bit about your background so people know who we're talking to today, and then we'll go right into the about the skin test. Sure. So I started in healthcare back in the 82nd Airborne as a, uh, as a medic with uh, an uh, infantry battalion over in Europe, and then ultimately found myself working in the pharmaceutical industry for a number of years in a variety of different commercial roles. And then I was asked to run a little a uh, medical device company that we ended up taking public on the NASDAQ for stimulating the vagus nerve. Um, and then ultimately, I decided to, to spend the rest of my career, hopefully, working on neurodegeneration. The one area in the 30 years that I've been involved doing this that we've made little headway, you know, conditions like ALS, conditions like Alzheimer's disease, uh, to some degree, Parkinsonism. Uh, MS and so forth. So the area that we focus in at Synapse DX is helping doctors definitively diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Well, that sounds that sounds like a very interesting career, and you didn't choose a very easy path for the the latter half of said career. But I, I applaud you. So, how um, can early detection of Alzheimer's help doctors and patients and family caregivers like myself? Well, we know from the literature that when a, when a doctor diagnoses dementia, which they typically use a psychometric test to do that, it's a mini mental exam or a MOCA test that they use uh, in their practice with a patient, um, that once they diagnose dementia, their ability to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, whether Alzheimer's is, disease is the cause of that dementia, is about the flip of a coin. It's not until the patient gets out to say years seven, eight, nine, that the clinician's ability to diagnose that condition really gets much better. It's, it's above 80% at that point in time. But diagnosing it early is really where the benefits come in. There, there have been countless studies published that lifestyle changes like physical exercise, mental exercises, um, even diet can have a profound impact on one's ability to, you know, start to thwart that cognitive loss as they are, are diagnosed with these conditions. So getting diagnosed early is very important because you could do things like lifestyle changes, uh, become more socially interactive and the like to really, to really help yourself there. The other thing is it's really good to know what your condition is early on so you can plan to spend time with family to do some financial planning, to do some of the things I think we all tend to do, which is, you know, we'll get to it someday. Um, so I think that's important. And then lastly, there are new drugs that are coming that have just been FDA cleared. And I think, you know, these drugs could help a patient who has these conditions, but also have some wicked side effects and they could hurt as well. So ensuring early, whether you have the disease or not, will help you and your family make a decision as to whether these drugs might be right for you. That makes sense. So tell us a little bit about this skin test and how, how it works on identifying the disease. Cause that just sounds, it's super fascinating to me because it's non evasive, seems pretty simple, but I'll let you explain it. Sure. So, um, Dr. Daniel Alcon, who uh, was trained at Cornell, you know, many, many years ago, uh, left his psychiatry practice, joined the National Institutes of Health, because he was really interested in what creates memory, 
why do I have these patients who had traumatic experiences as children, and then later in life, even midlife, some might even, you know, take their lives um, uh, through suicide, and yet it's all because of all these memories that they they keep over the years. And as his work evolved, he became a program chief at the National Institutes of Health down in Bethesda, Maryland, and um, it was really you know, this identifying that, you know, the memories really lie in the synapses in your brain. And when those synapses erode or are lost, then you lose those memories and you start to see this progressive cognitive decline. So Dr. Alcon had spent multiple decades kind of studying this work in animals, so preclinically. And then Jay Rockefeller, you may recall, the U.S. senator out of West Virginia, uh, his mother, Blanchette, had passed away from Alzheimer's disease, and he started the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. And he then took Dan Alcon, uh, recruited him out of the NIH to come and take the preclinical work that Dan developed and start to use it in humans. And one of the things that they decided to do when they were testing the various ways you may try to find this disease in the body was they used blood. And they found that blood was is really not very stable. There's an there's an enzyme in the body that starts to eat away at the proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease very rapidly. So to get a blood sample back to a lab somewhere and actually test it and be confident that it would work for identifying the disease was a challenge. So they started to use skin, and they found that skin was a very stable platform for looking for disease. And Dr. Alcon had opined that, you know, um, maybe Alzheimer's disease is not, a, is not just a brain disease. Maybe it's a, a systemic disease that affects different parts of the body. And what he found is much like the synapses stop networking and, and aggregating in the brain together, the same thing happened when you took a piece of skin, it's a very small piece of skin, a three millimeter skin punch. It's almost like taking blood. Um, Using that piece of skin to then try to find these proteins, we test for two different proteins, and we also image the skin as it grows over time, so we cell culture it, and we found that it, it that the Alzheimer's disease patient's skin doesn't network very well, doesn't aggregate very well, much like the synapses in the brain, and we were also able to find the proteins in the skin. So that's how a skin test was developed for looking for Alzheimer's disease. I never knew the skin like communicated with the rest of your body. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's uh, the uh, the biology of memory, uh, which is finding, for the most part, a protein called PKC epsilon and other proteins in the in the body that are, are a ratio. They're inflammatory proteins, ERK one and ERK two. When you look for those, you can find them throughout the tissues in the body, including in the skin. So actually what we can do with a piece of skin is we can mimic the biology of memory of what's happening in your brain by finding those biology in your skin. That's fascinating. I, I've always said, you know, people think that discovering other universes, other planets, space is our final frontier. And I, I vehemently disagree. I think the brain is the final frontier. I think we know less about our brain than we do about space. You're absolutely right. It's the one <clears throat> organ where we really don't take biopsies from, right? So, you know, people don't go in and have their head opened up to then give a piece of their brain to see if there's something wrong with them. Whereas today you could do that for, you know, various different organs in the body looking for cancers and things like that. So you're absolutely right. The brain, we know, we still today know very little about the brain. And as the technology advances for imaging and other things that we can do, like we're doing here at Synapse DX, I think we're going to learn more and more as, as you know, the next couple of decades unfold here. Well, that's good. That's good timing for me. I'm, I'm a early Gen Xer, so I'll be 57 in November. And my paternal grandmother lived to 103, so that's my goal. And yeah, we, we got to catch up on some of these, these treatments yeah. and preventions because I don't want to be like my mom. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years, so 
and her mom had vascular or mixed dementias, and my great maternal grandmother had also dementia. So we have to stop there because that's enough trauma for one family. So Alzheimer's sure. has been a really challenging and complex field. So how did they come about thinking about the skin as a place to test versus the brain? I mean, that doesn't seem like a natural correlation to me. Well, you know, when they found the proteins and um, were able to kind of mimic the way the skin grew with the loss of synapses, I'd say probably back in 1991 is when the field started to kind of shift and realize the reason why people lose their memory isn't because they get amyloid plaque in their brain or they get, you know, these tau tangles, they're called these proteins they can find in the brain. Um, it was really because they started to lose their synapses. And once the synapses eroded, as did the memories, and so did your short term memory, which is largely what Alzheimer's disease is. And, you know, Dr. Alcon decided that, you know, we're going to follow the gold standard definition for Alzheimer's disease, which is dementia in life and plaque tau in your brain at an autopsy so after you've after you've passed away and then along the in, in in the middle of that is to ensure that you've had this kind of precipitous decline in your memory you just didn't have some memory loss because there are a variety of different dementias um out there it's not just one alzheimer's disease seems to be the most devastating and also the most predominant it, it, it accounts for about 60 percent of all dementia but to your point a moment ago there are mixed dementias. People don't just have one. Sometimes they have multiple. So <clears throat> what he decided to do was let's take skin samples from people when they get newly diagnosed with dementia. So very early days, year one, year two, and let's follow these people out until we can get an autopsy. And he collected about 140 of those skin samples and over the years was able to get the autopsies. And it took him 10 to 15 years to collect this information. And we use autopsy as our way to validate the results from our three biomarkers or the, or the tests that we run called the discern test. Um, and that's kind of how they landed on this thought and idea that the skin was a stable platform. We can find the disease in the skin and the remnants of the disease. And then lastly, um, let's make it bulletproof. Let's validate it with autopsy. That's the only true way you know that a diagnostic out there can find the disease. And yeah, that's one of my biggest regrets. I had intended on donating my mom's brain. And then she fell and broke her leg at the very start of the pandemic. I had not figured out how one goes about donating a brain, which is something we need to fix. And... She passed away somewhat suddenly. I wasn't expecting it. And it's, I don't know, some people might find this morbid. I have a morbid sense of humor. I finished recording a podcast and went, oh no, she'd already been at the funeral parlor for long enough. And I went downstairs. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to call them and see if it's too late. And they had just called to say that I could pick up her cremains. I was like, mm, definitely too late. So I have since learned a little bit more about the donation process, but we definitely need to make it easier. Just like I have an organ donation sticker on my driver's license. Um, we should be able to make it easier to donate our loved ones brains because this is very really important research. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. 
You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, we, we would agree completely. <clears throat> We've been working across various different um, regulatory bodies in the marketplace. Our lab in the Bethesda, Maryland area is a CLIA certified lab. Just like about 99% of all diagnostics out there, you're either taking urine or saliva or blood or, in our case, skin. Um, so you're not really requiring the patient to ingest or inhale or inject some type of substance. So most tests are are very safe for people. So they're they're governed by CLIA and not by the FDA. In some cases, you could petition the FDA to validate and look at your science, which we have, um, which you know we think will be very important to be the first and only diagnostic um, regulated by the FDA for actually definitively diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. And I think that'll help with pharmaceutical company research and, and the like. But the challenge for us, especially as we're now navigating through the FDA, is exactly your point, right? So how do we get enough samples so that the FDA feels comfortable that we have enough? Is 140 like we collected originally enough samples? So we scour the planet looking for skin samples and other brain samples that we could potentially use with our test to continue to kind of build our our research. And it's been it's been a challenge, honestly. I mean, we we found recently a, a laboratory in Arizona down in the Sun City area where they have a large number of retirees where they had about 20 more samples that we collected and purchased from Banner Health. And then we're using that as, you know, as ad hoc to our, our original data set for the FDA. But the more comfortable folks feel with, you know, organ donation and perhaps even autopsies, um, you know, the medical centers around the world, you know, have definitely a need for gathering more and more information, especially when you consider the fact that this condition is is only going to triple in the next 20 years, to your point. The baby boomers are getting older. I think 10,000 people a day turn 65. So we're, we're going to have a need for more and more samples. So am I understanding loosely the process to donate a brain? Like I'm not far from UCSF, which has a really good memory center. That's not exactly what they call it, but close enough. Um, I would contact them and say, you know, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I would like to donate her brain um, after her passing. What's your process? So I have to kind of do all the legwork. Is that pretty much how it works? Pretty much. I mean, okay. you know, there are, you might be able to find a clinical study today where as part of the study, the, um, the subject, the patient will then participate in the study and as an ending of that study is they may, you know, also consent to having an autopsy done and having their, you know, brain used for science. Um, but you are correct. You you have to contact your local, you know, academic center, teaching hospital typically, and see how you might go about, you know, contributing to science, so to speak. Which probably never gets into the top five of your to-do list. <laughs> Exactly the point, right? <laughs> You're like me and you keep saying, I got to do that. I got to do that. And then, oops, yeah. too late. So it sounds to me like a skin test is fairly mm -hmm. safe. Are there any significant risk factors people should know about or any ethical considerations physicians should consider before performing the test? Seems um, seems a lot safer than like a lumbar puncture. Oh, yes. It would be a lot safer than a lumbar puncture or even in some cases – um, physicians might request that you have a PET scan done where you have to ingest radio labeled dye, which is a radiated substance. And those, that radiation lights up the, the remnants in your brain that they're looking for, and then they scan it. So, um, 
ours is pretty straightforward. You could even have a primary care physician or even a mid-level, like a nurse practitioner or a PA, just take a small piece of skin in the upper inside of your forearm. Um, you know, they put a Band-Aid over it right, right thereafter, and then they send the skin right to our laboratory. They have to get our kit first because it has all the, you know, stuff in it that you'll need to send send back. But it's very safe. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's like having a vena puncture or giving blood. Uh, it's, it's very similar. Um, and I don't think there are many ethical considerations. I, I, you know, we ensure that if we send a kid to a doctor's office, that they attest that they believe you have dementia, that they've diagnosed dementia. Um, we know from our clinical work that provided you have dementia, our results uh, have been published in the top journals for the three studies that we ran for the three different biomarkers. So um, we feel very confident and have shown, you know, in hundreds and hundreds of samples uh, commercially, not even in our research, we're selling the test today. And um, with that being said, um, as long as you have a dementia diagnosis, we're very comfortable that the doctor's results are going to be, you know, highly accurate. So that would be the only ethical consideration is, are you actually diagnosing dementia in these patients? Because if you get results from us, um, those two should go hand in hand. That makes sense. And to me, it seems highly beneficial that a general physician, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant can provide or no, um, perform the test because there's more of them than the specialists and it's one less barrier to getting a diagnosis. Yeah, it could take months to see a neurologist in the United States today. It's sad to say that, but there's not as many as we need and the population's getting older and the, and one of the biggest, you know, illnesses that people experience as they get older is, is they start to have some brain issues. Um, so to your point, yes, you know, a primary care physician can do that. Um, in some cases, medical assistants can even perform the procedure. It's, it's that simple. Um, and there's about 500,000 of these, of these skin punch biopsies that are done annually here in the United States alone. Um, wow. so they're, they're used number. for, yeah, they're used for a variety of different reasons, mostly dermatologists who do it, but we show a physician a three minute video to remind them of what they were taught to do back in medical medical school. And they and they jump right back on the on the bicycles if they were have been riding it all along. That's I love that. I'm a cyclist. So how can since my listeners are not doctors, how can we what can they do to help maybe persuade their medical group, their uh, primary care physician to to hop on the bandwagon, so to speak? Sure. So we recommend you go to discern.com. Uh, it has everything on the website for either a patient or a caregiver or a physician. Um, One-stop shopping. The physician can click the physician button. They fill out a 30-second, you know, patient requisition form. It's sent immediately into our lab. We then send the kit to the doctor's office. We can even validate and verify the insurance coverage. Right now, for our test, it's being reimbursed by Medicare. So if you are over 65 years of age and you have Medicare, you're likely going to have no issue whatsoever having the test paid for. If not, we can let you know what your insurance company uh, says with regard to our test. Uh, let you know if there's any copay or anything like that. But for the most part, if you have Medicare, um, you're not going to have an issue with with getting access to our test. So that's probably the the best way for you to go. Discern.com. Well, that'll be linked in the show notes. And this is fascinating. I just I've been doing this show for six and a half years, and I've seen a huge shift in testing treatments, different treatments like um, firing up the immune cells in our brain. And there's another company that's working on a, a molecule, I believe it is. It's supposed to attack neuroinflammation. This all gets above my pay grade. <laughs> but it's just, there's a lot that's happening. And it's kind of fun to share this with the listeners. You know, obviously, it's not going to do my mother any good or anybody that's, you know, beyond the stage of 
of any of these treatments being able to help, but it's nice to know that there's things coming and things available now, like the skin test that makes makes navigating this disease just a little bit easier, maybe. I would agree. And uh, I would also um, put a plug in for anybody who's listening that is you know, near that Medicare age to consider having a cognitive assessment every year when you go see your primary care doctor. Medicare covers it. Mm-hmm. They recommend it for all of us. It's a great way to track your your scoring so that if you think you might be having an issue or a problem, at least you have some history to kind of, you know, lean back on. And those cognitive assessments, you know, they're they're not painful at all. You actually fill out, you know, a, a quick assessment and that should really help your clinician understand kind of how you're doing brain health wise. So um, we know that once those cognitive assessments are done and there's any, um, you know, recognition of an issue or, or whatever else, um, having lifestyle intervention really, really works. I mean, you know, 40% of dementia out there can be, you know, helped by lifestyle intervention. And that's well documented. It's not me telling you that. It's not my opinion. Look at the Wake Forest studies, the finger studies, the pointer studies, et cetera. I mean, so there's a lot of information out there for you to really learn about how you might help yourself personally or a family member or a friend um, with regard to brain health. Well, that sounds like a perfect place to end. I talk about the mind diet and brain health a lot. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing about this new skin test and how we can help ourselves with it and, you know, maybe making some lifestyle choices. So you guys want to go to discern, D-I-S-C-E-R-N.com. And like I said, that'll be linked in the show notes. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate the time today. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.